It was the largest collection of tall ships since a battle in the Mediterranean 150 years ago. 26 nations, some from behind the Iron Curtain, combined in a spirit of international friendship for a massive parade of sail across the Atlantic to mark the American bicentennial. East met West, and the old world met the new. Not since the return of the astronauts from the moon had New York turned out like this for a ticker tape parade down Broadway. It was recognition for the 3,000 men and women, boys and girls, who'd brought almost 100 ships to the United States. Cheers mingled with tears. The 42 girls aboard the schooner Swinston Churchill unable to contain the emotion of the occasion. While their ship was by no means the biggest, they had formed the only all-girl crew and sailed a thousand miles in the best traditions of the sea. These were youngsters, like the boys on Great Britain too, promoting that underlying theme of today's tall ships, international understanding. If they didn't know it previously, they knew it now, but it was the last thing on anyone's mind two months before, early on a misty day in May. Ahead of them was a 3,000 mile voyage to Tenerife, Bermuda and Newport, starting at Plymouth. Not all the tall ships destined for the finale in America could make the start line at Plymouth. Only five were there, representing Poland, Norway, Ireland and Russia, led out by the Soviet Union's giant four-masted bark, Kruzhenstern. At 378 feet, she dwarfed the trimaran of Mike McMullen, who was to tragically lose his life in the transatlantic single-handed race. The square riggers were backed up by a fleet of adventure ships, ranging in length from 100 to 200 feet and bringing in crews from a further six nations. The Training Association, which started these races 20 years ago, was represented by its three-masted schooner, Sir Winston Churchill. The association had selected different crews for each of the three stages of the race, with boys taking the ship as far as Bermuda. Great Britain too, Che Blythe's catch, which won the first round the world race, led out a third class for smaller thoroughbred ocean races, all still adhering to the policy of at least half the crew being under the age of 25. Next stop for everyone, Tenerife. We set off uh, in very high spirits from Plymouth, had a very good send off and weather was quite nice. But um, during the afternoon, the uh, wind got up gradually and, of course, quite a lot of these boys are feeling seasick, which uh, you expect anyway. And um, all sorts of things started to go wrong. The sheets, which are the ropes that hold the jib in, they parted. And also, as a merchant ship was heading straight for us, and uh, there we were, rolling around out of control. And 
the uh, long and short of it was we had to get the sails down. We used the engine to get out of the way of the ship, which you're allowed to do if there's any emergency like that, and gradually got the sails sorted out. And by four o'clock we were sailing again, and it was all going reasonably well, although it was very rough by this stage, and there were big waves coming over. We experienced little trouble leaving the channel. Being larger than the racing boats, we were equipped with radar and other navigational instruments. It makes life much, much easier. As Navy cadets, we are perhaps more used to the sea than some of the other crews, but all of us are looking forward very much to take part in the race. Behind us now lie the little ships. There are some other schooners nearby us, but ahead, a long way ahead, are the very big square riggers. Working on the yards in a good wind is a good experience. You are possessed by the spirit of the wind. And at that height, you do not make a mistake twice. a large amount of water started to come in in the navigation compartments and so we then started to bail out with buckets and pumps and things and what had happened was that the food which is in boxes had been shifted in one of the big waves and had knocked a pipe off the hull and therefore water was coming through a two-inch pipe Great Britain, too, crewed by boys from the London Sailing Project, maintained her illustrious record with line honours at Tenerife. More of the world's few remaining tour ships were joining the fleet from Spain, Portugal and the United States. And by now, 50 vessels were preparing for the next leg of the race. It was a time to make everything shipshape, sail mending and bringing aboard provisions. However, the Irish aboard Phoenix didn't have to worry about eggs. Their chickens had clucked the 1,500 miles to Tenerife, and soon they'd cluck, cluck, off to Bermuda. The master of Poland's Dapa Moza, Captain Jakiewicz. And for an old sea dog, there's only one place to be. The sea, she is my country. The ship, she is like a wife to me. The cadets, they are my children. The ship and I together, we show them how to survive in this country, how to read its moods, how to enjoy its beauty 
and how to face its dangers. One day, they'll be full citizens of the sea, but never masters of this universe. No wind, the enemy of the sailing ship. The whole fleet lay helpless in mid-Atlantic. Ah, uh, that's correct. And now Hetman's position. Hetman's position. Uh, I'm unable to read uh, any ship reading Great Britain, uh, please. As the calms continued, it was the small boats that ran into trouble as provisions ran short. Darpamosa met up with another of the Polish entries, Voyevoda Kozielinski, and restocked her at sea. Elsewhere, Belgium Zenob Kram sacrificed her chances in the race to tow two smaller boats that had run out of fuel. For this, she won the Katisark Trophy, on the recommendation of the masters of all the other ships, for her efforts towards fostering international friendship. It had previously been held by Russia's Kruzhenstern. The problem of finding wind is not an easy one. Sometimes it can be achieved by monitoring and comparing the progress of other ships from the daily radio reports. But time dragged by, and eventually, as the time limit of 21 days expired, the orders were to proceed to Hamilton under power. <laughs> For the tall ships, it was a lazy motor to the next port of call. Bermuda, land of palm trees, balmy nights, old world charm, a new world money. For many of the crews, it was a time for a fond farewell to the tall ships as they made way for others who would complete the voyage to America. But for everyone, it was a chance to enjoy themselves in time-honored fashion. On board Sir Winston Churchill, 42 girls were thoroughly briefed on the complexities of the ship. She had been sailed by girls before, but never for so long or so far as the thousand miles that lay ahead. Not that they needed an excuse for a cocktail party, but the Swedes on Gladden had something to celebrate, the wedding of their king. Again, in the true spirit of the race, an opportunity for international friendship as crews from all around the world drank and laughed together. I've never been first.
further than Spain before. Well, Bermuda was everything I'd dreamed about. The sun, the music, and as for the ship, beautiful, just beautiful. While we were in the harbour, we were shown the ropes by the resident crew. Going aloft wasn't easy, but nobody complained. I'm sure I wasn't alone in feeling I'd swallowed a million butterflies. But being the only girl crew, well, we just had to show the boys. By now, the fleet had doubled to almost a hundred. Nineteen of them, the majestic square riggers. The final leg was to Newport, Rhode Island, and then on to New York for a July the 4th parade of sail. Calms were again forecast, but for the start there was a stiff breeze and a crowded start line, a combination of circumstances that nearly spelt disaster. Four of the tall ships were involved in collisions. One concerned America's Gazella Primero and Mercia of Romania. Both were trying to avoid another incident between Libertad of Argentina and Spain's Juan Sebastián de Elcano. After protests, Libertad was disqualified from the race reckoning for the tactics she'd used trying to get first across the line. We were quite a distance from that collision, thank goodness but I'll never forget this sickening sight. Underway, and Sir Winston Churchill with her all-goal crew, the only one in the race, was soon being overhauled by the smaller, faster entries like GB2. But did the girls mind? Not in the least. At sea, at last, it really felt great. A feeling of power mixed with serenity indescribable. We did watches, four hours on and eight hours off, and working the ship, we found it really exhausting. It took twice as many girls to handle the ropes as it would have taken men. But we were living, really living, every moment of the day. Forecasters were right. The wind dropped, and again the entire fleet was stranded. Today we were given permission to go for a swim, but an unexpected visitor put a stop to that. So we rigged a shower on deck and made do with that. These calms are getting on my nerves. It's nice to sunbathe in mid-Atlantic, but we're itching to see the sails fill out. The food makes up for most things, though. It's just like home cooking. Before we left, Cook warned us we'd get six meals a day, three down and three up. But in this weather, no one's suffering from seasickness. The forecasters are predicting wind. I hope they're right.
you're exhausted and exhilarated all at the same time. If you can imagine driving a freight train on the Big Dipper, that's what it feels like. And for some of us, the cook's dire predictions have come true. came as a pleasant change from the big heat and calms. But the wind did not blow long enough or good enough. Soon, we'll be in the United States. But I think not soon enough. The weather is no respecter of deadlines, and the tall ships had one, with July the 4th and the bicentennial looming nearer. The brief spell of wind wasn't enough for the majority of the ships, and again racing was abandoned and engines switched on. Newport, Rhode Island, and a truly bicentennial welcome. Five minutes after two o'clock at WABK, 82 degrees is your temperature in downtown Newport. And now, with our continued coverage of the arrival of the tall ships, we go back to Brenton's uh, Point State Park and Gary Crowder. Bob, thank you very much. The uh, Lewis Park from West Germany is around the Castle Hill right now, and it looks like the uh, Coast Guard Eagle is not going to wait for the rest. They have started to run into Newport Harbor. It's getting better all the time. Uh, I wish everyone that cannot see it could, because it's probably a once in a lifetime uh, thing to see. And I think the only thing that's going to surpass it is when all of the tall ships Americans in their tens of thousands flocked to Newport's fine harbor as the tall ships sailed in. For them, it was a chance to capture a slice of history. For those on board, the reception would never be forgotten. I cried, I was so emotional, it was fantastic. You actually shed a tear? Yes, <laughs> really did. The majority of people have a sort of an image of the, of the females as sort of sitting at home knitting, but that's not just true these days, is it? It's a, uh, girls are just as capable of doing things as their male counterparts are. Are we just as good as you are? <laughs> <laughs> the only time I've ever sailed, really, is across Lake Windermere on a ferry. <laughs> That's about it. So it was very rough, and I had to work in the galley. And that was really tough. I felt a bit sick then. <laughs> but, I mean, the ship was sort of really at an angle, and you were sort of crawling all over the place. It was quite slippy, really. It was a bit dangerous. Well, I thought so. Anyway. <laughs> I fell on my bum a few times. <laughs> While a few discussed who won what in each leg of the race, the confusion was immense due to the calms and orders to abandon racing and what they'd learnt from it. Captain Oleg Novich of the Darpamosa was in no doubt about what most had discovered. He was very keen to win. I remember our start in Primus and then a few days when we are trying to clear out of this channel, wind was again us, against us. But I think after the first uh, leg of races, we understood better that the idea of this is not only competing and not days are very important, like Lord Berham said in Santa Cruz, but just to be in, you know. The grand finale, New York, a parade of sail on the Hudson River and a ticker tape welcome on Broadway.
It's estimated that five million Americans joined New Yorkers to watch the parade up the Hudson River on July the 4th, among them the President and Vice President of the United States. Spectators could only gaze and wonder about a life before the mast, an experience which John Macefield once recalled like this after serving as a boy on a tall ship. She seemed filled with a fiery, unquiet life. She seemed inhuman, glorious, spiritual. One forgot that she was man's work. We forgot that we were men. She was alive, immortal, furious. We were her minions and servants. We were the stardust world in the train of her comet. We banged our plates with the joy we had in her. We sang and shouted and called her the glory of the seas. Bermuda and Newport, you think, gosh, did that really happen and am I really here? The only realistic bits are when you clean up, clean up the loser scrubbing down the decks, you think, oh, yes, I am here. <laughs>